Lovely to see you all. Uh, thanks for coming out. Thanks for having me here. Um, my wife, uh, Amanda, is with me, um, and we nearly didn't make it because of the, the storms in, in London, and our flight was cancelled um, on Friday, um, and then we got a flight up Saturday morning, and I was able to do all the events that, that, that were planned, uh, a men's breakfast, and then uh, speaking at Aberdeen Football Club last night, we had a wonderful... Hands up if you were there. Could you just let me know? Oh, just a few, a few of you, a hand, handful of you were there, which was a really good evening. Um, I think we had almost 300 people there and, and lots of folk there that weren't Christians. Um, and so it was a good opportunity to sort of bring the gospel to bear, even as I told a little bit about my, my life and, uh, and, and football and faith. And I, I've just um, written last year, it came out, my, my autobiography, um, A Greater Glory uh, from Pitch to Pulpit. Um, I, I was asked to write my biography several times. Uh, once when I was playing football, and I, I thought, no, you know, I, you know, I'm still. What have I done? You know, I'm still playing the game of football. I'm still pretty young. And then I, I finished playing football, and then they said, well, why don't you do it now? And I thought, no, I'll wait. And and then when I was 50, um, that's a, you know, half a century is quite a long time on this earth. So I thought, well, maybe now I've got a little bit of life experience where I can sort of reflect on my life and, and, and put it into book form. And, and I think um, that everyone should write their biography. I think everyone should write their memoirs, even if you never publish them. Because what happens is when you start writing it down, you see that actually your story is a story of God's grace to you. It's a story of God's grace. And as I reflected on, on, on my life, in my particular life as being a footballer and then a TV pundit and then moving into to church ministry, um, I was able to see the hand of God at different points in my life all the way along uh, in his grace to me, in, in saving me and, and in preserving me, sustaining me uh, and growing me. And so that really a biography that usually would point to yourself is really a biography that points uh, to him. Um, and so that was, that's the point of, of, of my biography, and that was some of the flavor of the, the stuff last night. And so you've kindly invited me here this evening. Um, uh, I'll just, I think I'll just tell you a little bit about my life and faith for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then I'd like to, to open it up if, if you want for some questions uh, from the floor. So if you, even as I'm speaking, please uh, think of questions that you might want to ask me, and you know, it can be anything, it can be about football, but it can be about faith, wisdom, application stuff. More than happy to try and answer questions that, that you might have for me. Um, so, my name is Gavin Peacock. I've introduced you to my wife Amanda. We've been married 32 years now. Um, we got married in 1989 when hair was big and shoulder pads were big too. But hair was big. I mean, you can't imagine it. I had hair and thick hair, it was a mullet. Um, 1989, we got married. We have two children. Uh, our son Jake is turning 29 this year. Um, our daughter Ava. Uh, she's 26. Jake is married to Krista, and uh, they've just uh, a year ago had uh, their first baby, our first grandchild, uh, little Charlie. Um, so he's just turned one. And then Ava married Austin uh, three and a half years ago. Um, and, and they're both saved. Their spouses obviously are Christians, and actually they're all members of our church in Calgary, Alberta, where we live. Um, which, for those of you that don't know, is in Western Canada, um, one province in from British Columbia. So if you think about Vancouver, right on the west coast of Canada, that's in British Columbia. The next province in is Alberta. That's Rocky Mountains territory. Um, very cold, very beautiful, but very cold. So we just received a photograph from our son-in-law this morning. Snow on the ground, minus 21. So we're just delighted to come here to have some hot weather. It's in Aberdeen. It's, it feels like the, the Costa del Sol to us in, um, in Spain. So uh, beautiful place, very cold, and, um, and hard ground for the gospel as well. So the church that, that, that I'm part of, I'm an associate pastor of, of the church there in, in Calgary. Um, been flying a flag for Protestant evangelical uh, Christianity for 
for 16 years and, and we've really seen the Lord uh, bless us and particularly in the last few years and even I would say in the difficult two years that we've all faced around the world with, with the COVID situation how a faithful preaching of, of the word of God and keeping the gospel of Jesus Christ central has drawn people um, from different places and different nations and, and the Lord's growing us in numbers I think as well as uh, as in holiness so we're very encouraged and I, I think that is good for us uh, for me to tell you that uh, as an encouragement to you because they in Calgary now uh, I believe the word of God will be being preached right now so it's quite interesting you know we're, we're seven hours ahead here and and they're preaching now so even as the as a as the universal church family we're, we're, we're connected together and uh, we all face similar trials in different times. So that's just a little bit of, of, of my background now. But if I can go back to, to the beginning of my story, I was um, brought up in a footballing family, actually. My father, Keith, uh, Keith Peacock, was a professional footballer for Charlton Athletic uh, for 17 years. And he played in the 1960s and the 1970s. And he actually holds the record for... Uh, the most outfield appearances of any player in Charlton's history. The only person that beat him was a goalkeeper called Sam Bartram. And, uh, and what my dad was a good footballer. He was captain of, of Charlton. But what he's, he became very famous for is that he was, an interesting fact, he was the first substitute ever used in English football. So, so back in the day, I used to say when men were men, right? Yeah, it was 11 v 11, and you know, there was no substitutes. If you broke your leg, you ran it off. You just kept going. They were proper men in those days. Now, now you can't tackle anyone, you know? Um, so they decided, right, we've got to maybe have a, t a 12th man, you know, for injuries or tactical change. And on the day in, in 1965, August 1965, when, when the Football League brought it in, he was the number 12 that day for Charlton. And there was an injury after, I think, 15 minutes of the game. And on comes my dad and he's clocked as the, as the, the first substitute. And... Um, it's a trivial pursuit question, apparently, in European trivial pursuit. And, and my dad hates it because he says, I've played more times than any other play, outfield player in, in Charlton's history, and I get remembered for not being good enough to be in the starting lineup on one particular day. Um, but but it, it was a privilege growing up in a, in a footballing family. Mum and dad were uh, loving parents, uh, not Christian, but they were loving parents who brought me and my sister up well, and we were in a home where we knew we were loved, but we were well disciplined. Um, and of course, I had then this example of my father, uh, who never pushed me uh, into, into playing football, but always encouraged me, was a really good dad who was present with me and my sister, and he was a wonderful coach as well. So I grew up around the smell of the dressing room, going down to Charlton's uh, football ground, the training ground, whenever we had school holidays. And, and so there was that example there for me to follow. So all I ever thought about doing was following in my dad's footsteps, becoming a professional footballer. And like a lot of uh, young boys, it is a schoolboy dream. And I guess for some girls now, it's a, it's a schoolgirl dream with the, uh, the growth in, in women's football over the last um, decade or so. Um, so I just went through the usual process. I played at school, and, um, and I got into the district team, and then I, I, I got into the county team, Kent County. Uh, and then uh, when I was 15, I played for England schoolboys. So now you're, I was at a level where, obviously, I'm one of the best schoolboys in the, in the country. And uh, that was in the days where, at the end of every season, they, they would... Uh, have a televised match on ITV, and it was always England schoolboys be Scotland schoolboys. Um, so that was just a big match. And do you think at 15, I was, you're walking out at Wembley, there's 60, 70,000 people there, and it's England, Scotland, um, and it's just a, an, an iconic thing. And so it was then that you know all the football clubs around wanted to, to sign me. And I ended up actually uh, signing for Queen's Park Rangers. Um, Arsenal and Tottenham, Liverpool and Aston Villa, other clubs wanted me. But I chose Queen's Park Rangers because they were a top 
flight team uh, at, at the time, uh, but their manager was a, a guy called Terry Venables. And of course, Venables went on to become England manager in the late 1990s, but he was a bright young manager who had a reputation of bringing young players through. And, and QPR then had the first ever plastic pitch, AstroTurf pitch, ever used at, at the top level. Um, so that was un unusual, you know, you had to be a, able to have good skill, good control, be technically very good to, to play for QPR. So I, I signed for QPR and, and I'd achieved the schoolboy dream and, you know, it's, it's everything that the world says will make you happy, isn't it? Being a professional footballer, you know, you, you have the fame, you have the, uh, the money, I mean, particularly nowadays, not, not so much uh, back in, in my day, uh, but nowadays, you know, very much about the money, but even then it was better than average. Um, so fame, money, uh, this, this great career, you know, that's going to make you happy. Um, and that's what the world tells, tells you, isn't it? Those kind of ingredients in life will make you happy, will give you satisfaction. And yet it was a strange thing because uh, I got it, I had it, and now I'm, I left school at 16 and, and now I'm in this man's world of, of professional football. And yet I wasn't quite satisfied. It didn't make me happy as I thought it would do um, because football was my God. If I played well, I was up. If I played badly, I was down. And so... I'm 17, going, now going on 18 years old. I'm navigating my way here, trying to make my way into the, into the first team. Uh, I'm now in the reserves at, at QPR. And, and yet I'm thinking, boy, this is, I've hit a ceiling here. And so I'm sort of questioning in, in these things. Um, at the same time, I was living at home with, with my mum and dad. And one night, my mum said, oh, I'm just going to pop along to the, to the local church. An, e an evening service. Uh, like this, and, and I said, oh, well, I'll, I'll come along to, to keep you company. Now, bear in mind, my mum's not a Christian. She was just checking it out, and I just thought, I'll go keep her company. And the, the minister said to me after the service, he said, oh, Gavin, I have a, a youth meeting uh, at my house. Uh, why don't you come along? He said, we have it every Sunday after the evening service. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. Um, I'll come along. Um, so I pulled up to the to his, the minister's house that night in, in my Ford Escort XR3i. Now, who remembers that car? There's a few people that can go back that far. And you youngsters, you need to look it up because it was a real 1980s car. Uh, sporty, it had the spoiler on the back. And of course, I had the, I told you, I had the haircut to match. And so I, I, I've got the car. I, I get out the car. You know, I've, I'm in the in crowd. I've got the career. Got a little bit of money in my pocket. I walk into the room that night. These young people there, half a dozen or so young people, my own age, they did not have what I had. No, none of what I had. Uh, they weren't so-called in crowd. Um, but when they spoke about Jesus Christ, uh, and when they prayed, they had a joy and a reality that I did not have. Um, and so the first thing that I noticed was the, the witness then, the testimony, if you like, without even saying too much of, of other believers. So that's just, a, I think, an encouragement to all Christians is that, you know, it, it's the way you are, it's the joy that you show in Jesus that can have a powerful effect even in drawing people uh, to Christ. Of course, they need to hear the gospel and believe to be saved, but it was really that kind of witness of those guys and thinking, wow, there's a joy here they have, there's a reality here they have that I don't. And then it was over the next couple of weeks that I heard the minister unpack from the Bible uh, what is the gospel. Uh, you know, I began to see, as he showed uh, fr from the very beginning of the scriptures, that God had made this universe and everything in it, including uh, man as male and female in his image, uh, to live under his rule, his benevolent good rule, as he gives everything uh, to Adam and Eve in, in the garden. Um, and yet, because of their disobedience, and ever since then, all men and women have fall short of the glory of God and have, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and um, you know, I, I might have thought God was up there somewhere before and, and you know, people would talk about sin, but God had no bearing on my life and, and sin in my mind might be doing a few things wrong, but, but everyone does things wrong, don't they? Until I saw from the Bible that, no, 
Sin wasn't just the things I did, it was the things I thought. It was the things that I, I said and that, that I was a sinner by nature uh, because I'd inherited the nature of, of Adam and, and that if God was to be good and just, uh, that I must sit under that justice and he must deal with that sin and he must punish that sin. Um, and at this point I'm thinking... Now, I was told gospel means good news. Where's the good news at this point? Uh, until then, the minister went on to explain, yeah, God, God is just. Uh, you're, you're a sinner that sits under that justice, but because of his great love, because of his great grace, he's given his only son, Jesus Christ, who came and, and who lived and died and, and rose again uh, as a substitute, taking the punishment for sinners on the cross and living a perfect life of obedience that we can never live and and that's just so freeing because um, we all get caught up in that works righteousness performance mentality football what's it about it's about your performance and you know, on, on a Saturday so I was in that mode well, I do well I earn it I get my place in the team and uh, and it's suddenly not about my performance but the performance of Jesus Christ for me and that I was to recognize that, to turn from my sin and trust in him, and I could have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and know the God uh, in a right relationship, know the God who made me and who has loved me. And I believed upon Jesus, um, and I was saved. This is at age 18. Um, and suddenly, then, as, as Christ broke into my life, uh, football wasn't God anymore. Jesus is God. And everything began to make sense. I had identity. I had purpose. I knew my place in, in the universe. Suddenly, I wasn't the sum of all my performances on a Saturday. That wasn't my identity. My identity lay elsewhere. Um, and I had a future and a hope beyond football. Football wasn't everything. Um, and, and, and so it actually helped me, I think, to become a better footballer. Because that pressure was, was lifted all of a sudden. Um, it's a tough world being a professional footballer. You know, you're, it, it's, it's cutthroat. And you have to be able to deal with lots of criticism. Um, criticism from your fellow professionals. Criticism from your manager. Criticism from, from the crowd. And, and it can be something that crushes you. Uh, unless your identity and hope and security lies elsewhere and suddenly I knew Jesus was with me with me to the end of the age and 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 if he's for me who can be against me and and I actually felt the pressure lift and began to I think play better I it wasn't too long and I was in in the first team and and then I told the straight away I told the other players that I was a Christian um, I was 18 at the, at the time and so you know it's, I was thinking what are they going to say you live with a bunch of guys for 10 months of the year. They'll know what you get up to at the weekend. So what did you do this weekend? Oh, I went to church. Oh, why did you go to church? Well, I've become a Christian. And it spread like wildfire around the training ground. Oh, Peacock's become one of those born-again Christians, as if there's any other kind. Um, I said that last night. Not many people laughed. I said, it's a Christian joke. <laughs> and not many people laughed at them. Um, but yeah, so, so the guys are like, oh, he's become a Christian. And like anything new, uh, there was a bit of Mickey taking. There was a bit of ribbing went on. But then, but then they watched to see if, if my life matched what I professed. And again, you know, a, a, a good encouragement, I think, for, for all of us is that, you know, we say we're a Christian and then people will watch our lives, whether you're at school, whether you're in the workplace, uh, parents, uh, with children at home, professing Christians, your children watch you. And they watch to see if what you say uh, is matched by your lifestyle. And we know that it won't be a perfect consistency, but there will be a consistency there. And it gets back a little bit to when I went to the, the meeting that night and I heard the, the people speak about Jesus with this love and joy. And, um, and so... I think there was something there because I had some amazing conversations with footballers you'd never think would ask about Christianity over the almost 20 years that I was a footballer. Um, 
because footballers are really, deep down, pretty insecure, living off their nerves. They know their career can be over in a, in a second. Um, and it's at times where that's rocky, where they're injured or you've had bad results or there are players in bad form, where they can open up. And um, it was remarkable the, the different conversations I had. Now, many, peop- many of those players rejected Jesus uh, as Lord and Savior, uh, but there were one or two that, that, that came to save in faith. And uh, when I was at Chelsea Football Club, um, my wife and I hosted a, a London footballer's Bible study for several years and, and some professing Christian players would come along and, with their wives and, and we'd have a little message from the Bible and we'd sing and, and pray together. It was remarkable days, you know, to, to, to have that kind of thing going. Um, so going back to, to then just becoming a Christian, I get into the first team uh, at QPR and I meet my wife-to-be, Amanda. Uh, I was studying at night school in London, uh, history. And it was the first night of, of this course. And uh, there was, she came into the class late. And there was one place left at the table where I was sitting. And she sat down next to me. And I thought, oh, I like this girl. Smile. I'm going to chat to her at the break. OK? Because I was really concentrating on the history, not. <laughs> So uh, we, I went up to her and started chatting, and she said, oh, what do you do then? I thought, I've got this in the bag. I'm a footballer. It's a killer line for the girls. It gets the girls every time, surely. So oh, I'm a professional footballer. She went, oh, I don't really like football at all. I was like, oh, God's humbling me here. But she was very interested when I said I was a Christian, because new Christian, I'm telling everyone at this point I'm Christian. And she started to come to church with me, and then... Uh, Amanda was saved after a a couple months and then we got to know each other and we ended up being married a couple of years later. And so then as a married uh, man, my my career was was on its way. I I went to, uh, Harry Redknapp uh, bought me at Bournemouth Football Club. We were down there for the first year of our marriage and and then I remember Harry uh, calling me over after training one day and he said to me, Gavin, Newcastle United have come in for you. And I didn't hear anything else. I just knew I've got to go to Newcastle. And I went home to Amanda, and we've been married a year, and she got the house all nice. We've got a nice little house, and it's warm down in Bournemouth, and the sea's there and everything. And I said, Amanda, I said, Newcastle United have come in for me, and uh, it's a big club, and we've got to go. And she just burst into tears and said, where's Newcastle? I said, oh, it's up north and it's cold. I said, but it's a great opportunity to go. And she was brilliant and we you know, rallied t- together and we, we went up there and we had three great years at, at Newcastle, uh, culminating with a uh, promotion to the Premier League uh, with Kevin Keegan. Keegan came to Newcastle and, and set the place alight, and I just loved playing uh, for Kevin. He was just this great leader of men, great motivator. We get to the, the Premier League, and we, we, we've, we've won the, 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 the championship, what it's called now. We ran away with it. I was captain of Newcastle, and things couldn't be going better. I was at the peak of my powers, and at the same time, Amanda uh, had fallen pregnant with our first child. So all through the pro- promotion season, uh, she's pregnant and growing, and it's as if the baby is about to burst out right and celebrate the promotion at the end of the season. And literally, we got promotion, and, and there was an open-top bus ride around the city centre of Newcastle, 100,000 Geordies, uh, lined the streets, and uh, 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 about a week or so after that, Amanda went into labor, and it was a very, very difficult labor. Uh, she was two days, and um, in the end, they were very concerned about uh, the baby getting enough oxygen, and uh, it was a forceps delivery. His, the cord was wrapped around the neck a couple of times, and anyway, I was just there and, and, and looking just to see, you know, is it a boy or a girl, and then uh, he cried, I was, I was a boy, right? And then he cries, and then I see, oh, half of his uh, right arm is missing. So Jake, our son, was born without uh, his right hand. So there's a third of his forearm on that side. And we didn't know. We didn't know this at all. In those days, we only had one scan, and for whatever reason, the way he was lying or, or what have you, we didn't see. So it was a total shock at the end of this traumatic uh, labor. And... 
then to go from the highest you felt to then just this uh, gut-wrenching feeling and then the ground begins to, to wobble. And, you know, I realized then, you know, I'm at the peak of my powers. I, 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 you know, I'm a professional footballer. It, 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 the career is there and yet I've been brought low, uh, really low. And, you know, it just shows the fragility that we all have and that we don't know what is around the corner. But it's then, it's in those moments you find out on what ground do you stand? Upon whom are you standing? Um, and as the days went on, and as Christian friends came around us and encouraged us, we knew we stood on the rock. Uh, we knew that God was good. We couldn't understand everything around it, uh, the particular suffering that we had, as, as many of you, I don't know all of you, but I know you'll all be suffering or have suffered many, many things, and, and it perplexes us at times, and we don't know why God has allowed it, brought it into our lives, but we do know he's good. We do know he's good because he gave his son for us. And so our sufferings then as, as Christians drive us back to trusting in God and his wisdom, even as we know he is good uh, through sending Jesus to be our savior. And that our sufferings then work to strengthen us, almost like physical fitness training. I always say suffering uh, strengthens the fibers of faith. So that's what he does. It's like going to the gym and you hit the gym and it's painful. Or you're running and it's painful. If you did not know that you'd be fit at the end of that, you'd give up. But the Christian knows that there's a purpose in the suffering. And there's a spiritual fitness that happens at the end of it. And that's why you don't give up. Because there's purpose in suffering for, for the Christian. And I think we can all look at the last couple of years and say we've all suffered in many, many ways. And yet there's purpose for God in that suffering. Jesus Christ will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And he's always doing his good, good to his people. And the, the church is the apple of God's eye. And, um, and so these are lessons we learn in age 25, 26. Um, it got out in the newspapers and uh, we suddenly started to get letters from all over the country. Uh, from different folks, people who had been born with one hand, uh, uh, parents who'd had a ch child with one hand, all encouraging us, Christians as well. And, um, and so at the time, Newcastle got to the Premier League. I then say to, said to Kevin Keegan, I love it here, but we're from the South and we'd like to be closer to our family. You know, it's our first child. There's some difficulties here that we've got to deal with. Um, I'd like to go if possible. And Kevin was brilliant. He showed great compassion. And he said, I won't outprice you in the market. Within a few weeks, Glenn Hoddle had the Chelsea job and he made me his first major signing. And, and I went from one great club and one great manager to play for another and had four tremendous years uh, at Chelsea and really was part of turning the club around from, you know, a decent premiership team to a cup team that could compete in Europe and and um, and then you know what they are now is is something different when I was at Chelsea uh, I was club captain and I used to go and battle for an extra 50 pounds on our win bonus because we got 250 pound if we won a Premier League game that's amazing isn't it to think that now they're getting I don't know, £200,000 a week. We had players in the team that were earning, you know, £750 or £1,000 uh, a week, which is decent money, but it's just gone through the roof uh, now. It's a, it's a different world in many, many ways. So Chelsea, uh, at the end of my Chelsea career, I went to QPR, so the back to the team that I started with, um, and even got to play in my final year, I got to play for Charlton, which was my dad's team. I had a three months on loan there, and I had a few games back in the Premier League. And, and so at age almost 35, uh, it was time for me to, to retire. Then what do you do? You know, um, I still had a mortgage, uh, but I knew that, uh, that God would provide for me. He had all the way so far. And, and I was called to act, of course, and not just be passive, but he would take care of me. And I considered management, but then the media side of things was becoming really big. And um, so I thought, let me try that out, you know, the Sky, BBC stuff. And, and I started to back at scratch again. I, I started to 
earn my trade. And um, I was doing capital radio commentaries, traveling from London to Middlesbrough on a Saturday for a hundred pound uh, and doing co-commentaries. And then BBC Five Live had me on there. And then the the, the guys that work, the, the editors of the TV shows, are listening to you on Five Live Radio, and they thought, oh, we'll give him a go on TV. And suddenly, I was doing the African Cup of Nations, and Football Focus, and Final Score, and Match of the Day, and it built and built. I was the, the male pundit for all the women's football. That's why I know and see, see how that has grown over the last 10 years. And it couldn't have been going well. It was a second dream career. You know, I'm working with guys that I'd played against or played with. I'm talking about the game I, I love. I love to bring insight of the game to people at home. And it was a, a thrill to do it for six years. And I went to World Cups and the European Championships. And around 2006, Amanda got quite ill and was in hospital for a couple of weeks. And as, again, we get back to suffering, suffering can recalibrate your focus a little bit. And I was praying and reading the Bible, and I, I, I read in, in 2 Timothy 4, where Paul, uh, almost as his last words to Timothy, says, preach the word, Timothy. Preach the word, in and out of season. In other words, for the sake of the future of Christianity, preach the word of God. And I thought, what a charge that is. What a, what a vocation that is. And something inside me stirred. Now, that's an internal feeling, an internal fire lit. Um, but then I went to speak to my church leaders, and they said, yeah, we see certain things uh, there. We'll test that out over time. And I was doing Match of the Day and all of those shows. I started to do some studies in theology, Old Testament and New Testament, at uh, Cambridge University. So I'm on TV at the weekend and then driving up to Cambridge on a Monday and Wednesday and I'm in with all the guys that are going into church ministry and all they wanted to ask me about was football. And they said, oh, I can't believe what you said at the weekend about Arsenal and oh, you could give Manchester United a bit more of a mention and, and, and all I wanted to do was study the Bible. And that's when I said to Amanda, I think I'm going to give it up, the second dream career. And people will think I'm mad, but I think this is what the Lord may have called me to, but I want to take some time to prepare and do my theological studies. We could do it in England, but my profile is really high. Uh, and I, maybe if we went to anonymity, where no one knows us, and all they hear um, is what this man says from the Bible and not get the football, football pundit guy confused with it, what about it? And our kids were 15 and 12 at the time, um, so it was a big decision, um, but we decided to go to, to Calgary, Alberta. We'd been going there quite a bit. We knew the area. We, we, we'd been going for, for holidays for, for quite a few years. And um, I enrolled in a seminary there, and I did my master's in theology. And three years later, we were looking to come back. A couple of churches were interested, and a church in Calgary offered me uh, a position there. And, uh, and then we stayed, and that's... 13 years ago uh, now, um, and quite a remarkable journey then from pitch to pulpit, which is the subtitle of, of my book, uh, with a bit of punditry um, in between. Um, and, and so what I'm doing now is, is, is a great joy. I often say, you know, I've played in, at Wembley in front of almost 100,000 people. Uh, and that's been beamed around the world in an FA Cup final to whatever it is, 90, uh, 100 million people. Um, and yet I feel more the weight of responsibility and more, if you like, um, a different kind of nerves, but a butterfly is in the summer when I bring the word of God uh, on a Sunday. Uh, because you're dealing with eternal things. You're dealing with people's souls. Uh, you're dealing with life and death. Football is great, but Jesus is greater. Um, and so there's a greater glory uh, in life than football, fame, and fortune. And it's a glory that, that all of us here, if we're Christians, if we love the Lord, we know that. Um, and so we have this treasure uh, and, this, and this great glory that we know um, that the world doesn't know. Uh, and so that brings us a great uh, uh, assurance and, and a great hope in this life because our best life is still to come. And, uh, and so I'm just an elder, a pastor in the local church. Uh, that's, that's what I am, that's what I do, and, and the Lord's opened up doors then f 
in a wider ministry sense for me to travel and I probably now spend maybe 10 weeks of the year traveling, come back to the UK when invited by different churches. Um, I, 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 I do evangelism, of course. Um, I preach on a Sunday and I'll, I'll teach seminars on, on marriage and, and manhood and womanhood and sexuality, which are key issues in our day in particular and on which I've written uh, several books as the Lord's opened up doors for me uh, to, to be an author. And so, you know, I, I just say that really my story is the story of a, an ordinary kid from uh, the southeast of England uh, who was extraordinarily blessed by uh, a gracious God, uh, had the privilege of living um, uh, as a professional footballer for a few years, but those things pass. Um, and if you're a Christian, you know that you're always growing, that the Lord's growing you in fruitfulness, uh, and that as the outer man fades away, the inner man is strengthening. Um, we never, none of us know uh, what is round the corner. Uh, life is a breath. Uh, wisdom teaches us to consider the end of things, and the Christian knows the end uh, that is coming, and the end is really just the beginning uh, for us. And so... What a great privilege to do what I'm doing. What a great privilege to, to, to be a Christian. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that and to encourage you and to also say, you know, tell people the gospel because you just never know. You just never know the fruit of the words. You know, the, in, in John 15, you know, the, the, the vine and, and the branches. Uh, Jesus says that uh, the true branches will bear much fruit. That's an interesting phrase, bear much fruit. And some of us can look and think, well, I don't think uh, I bear too much fruit, but all true Christians will bear much fruit. And I think, and part of that fruit, yes, it's Christ-likeness. It's also the fruit of uh, conversions that come from uh, evangelism from the mouth of Christians and who knows you tell people the gospel on on that day when Jesus comes there might be a line of people that you never knew on that day they didn't uh, become Christians but they heard the gospel and and down the line you played a part in uh, in bringing them to Christ so just to encourage you to press on in the Christian life and press on in in Christian witness so maybe if we I uh, open it up now to if any of you have any questions you want to ask me before we close. Are we singing at the end or are we just closing at the end of this? At closing at the end of this. So, yeah, any questions? I think there's a roaming mic. Well, there's a man with a roaming mic. The mic won't roam on its own. Roving mic. Any questions you might have? Even if you were there last night and you didn't ask one, you can ask tonight. Oh, there's one at the back. Oh, there's one here. This gentleman here. Have you ever emulated Beckham? <laughs> I think I've tried to emulate Beckham, like tried to bend it like Beckham and I couldn't quite do it. Um, and as you can see, I could never do anything with my hair. <laughs> like it. Yep. I scored a goal from a corner kick. You did? Yes. Were there any witnesses? Because we all get better in our minds as the, as the years go on. <laughs> yeah, I played against Beckham actually uh, when he, he would have been 18 and just breaking into the Manchester United team. And we, we, I was at Chelsea and we played Man U in a pre-season friendly. And I came in at half time and I said, God, who's the good looking kid playing on the right side of midfield? He's decent. And someone went... Beckham, I think is his last name. And within a year, he was in the England set up. So, quite, quite the player. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if um, you think it's m more difficult today to be a Christian in, in sport than it was in your day. And specifically, if you were asked to wear a captain's armband with a rainbow collar on it, would you wear it? Great question. Um, it, yeah. Did you sign for QPR and not Liverpool? My son was wanting uh, about that. I did. I missed that. I, why did I sign for QPR and and not Liverpool? And not Liverpool, because they were interested in me. Uh, Liverpool actually interested in signing me. I think 
well, starting with that one, QPR, I mean, I was a London lad, but uh, it was really a couple of things. Obviously, QPR was a smaller team than Liverpool, but uh, I thought Terry Venables uh, and my dad, who was in the game, said he's, he's going to be one of the best managers around and to play for him. Uh, and then coming, I thought I could probably break through a bit quicker in a smaller pool of players than if I went, went to Liverpool. Um, do I think it's more difficult now to be a Christian in, uh, in professional football than it was in my day? I think it's a good question because I, in my day, uh, Christianity and foot, in, uh, f- religion and football wasn't really talked about too much and it was probably mocked a, a, a little bit more. Now, when you've had the influx, influx of all the um, players from all different cultures around the world. I think religion has been talked about a little bit more. There's Muslim players and Jewish players and, uh, and, and players that have come. So there's that, there's the, it's culturally become um, more easy to talk about. Um, but you know what? I, you know, people just, just kind of jumping off of that. People say, is it difficult to be a Christian and a professional footballer. And I say this, it's difficult to be a Christian in any walk of life because all of us are fighting against the world, the flesh and the devil. There are particular pressures though in being a professional footballer and a Christian um, because you're, it's very public, very public, your faith. If you're you know, open about your faith, it's very, very public. And you face pressures that are absolutely huge um, but they come on, from a Saturday to a Tuesday, really up from the back pages, headlines for, for, for doing well on, on, on the weekend, and by Tuesday you're the villain, uh, you know, the fans are booing you and you're out for the team. So you select these massive highs and massive lows, and people are watching you very publicly. Um, would I wear a captain's armband with a rainbow uh, on it? No, I wouldn't. Because I'd have to stand on, uh, you know, on on what is true from the scriptures, and I think that um, so it gets a little bit back to your question of being now being a Christian and being a footballer because you're being asked to do things and make even political statements um, as if it's expected of you as a player, and it doesn't seem to be a lot of room then for you to be able to stand on the Bible if you're a Christian. So if I wanted to say certain things as a Christian now, publicly, uh, if I was a professional footballer, I might, it might be, it's going to bring me into conflict with, with my club and, and especially with some of the policies that they have. So I would then be standing, as a couple of sportsmen have done in the last couple of years, um, maybe to be made an example of by the world, but I, I would have to risk that. And I would be willing to risk that. To stand for Jesus, and and that's, but then that's the case for all of us, right? For all of us in this day, we have to be sure of the Word of God, and we have to stand on the authority and sufficiency of the Word, because that's what the, all this stuff's about: is the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God. And we've got to know the Word, we've got to be rooted in the Word, and then we've got to, with all the love in the world and all the wisdom in the world, uh, express what we think appropriately. So and not cave to a cultural agenda. Yes, little fella here. God, these are good questions. Like, it's the end of a long weekend for me. I'm really tired now, and you hit me with a guess of good questions. So, say it again. If I had a... If I had a... If you had a match on a Sunday, would you have gone to the football match or the Are or you church? talking about when I was your age or when I was a professional footballer? Professional. Okay. So uh, being a professional footballer then was my job. Um, when I was uh, playing, there were a few Sunday matches started to come in when they were on t- TV. Um, and the odd time I would have then played in, in that match because it was my job to do. It wasn't my habit of doing it, though. Um, and often I was able to still be at church on an evening service. Um, but I think it's, a, it's a, another, you know, getting to your question of 
back then and now, even for, for, for youngsters, you know, what do you do? If you're a good footballer, you might be asked to play on Sundays. And, and I would just say to you that, um, what I said in the talk, that, that, that football is great, but Jesus is greater. And, um, and that, you know, if you honor God, God will honor you. And sometimes that means making difficult decisions, decisions that people think, oh, he's crazy, she's crazy for making that decision. But you honor the Lord, you, you stand uh, on the word of God, and, and you will find that, that God honors you. And there's a, you know, football is just a few years. Um, a life with Jesus is, is, is eternity. So if you can know that lesson now, that's a great lesson you've learned. Yeah. Was it freeing? Was it freeing when you moved from uh, from the United Kingdom to Calgary and Alberta, where you were, no offence, but basically unknown? You were just a guy coming to go to a church, be a assistant pastor, or whatever else. Was it freeing? Were you yeah. with those strings cut, and you felt yeah. you could do something you couldn't do in in England? Yeah, I thought at first you said, "Was it freezing?" It was definitely <laughs> well, freezing. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but freeing. It was, you know, the, 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 I would say at least the, fir- the first decade, we've been there 13 years, so the, the first 10 years, the hardest 10 years of our lives, hardest, leaving family and friends and the country and the culture. You, you know, I don't know if any of you have emigrated, but it's a, it's a hard thing to do. So there was a, a certain sense of, of freedom in it because you go in and, but in that, I mean, we loved being in England. We loved uh, our lives, we loved our family, there was a cost to it. Um, so it wasn't like we were sitting here thinking, oh, we've got to get out of the country, we really want to go. And let... No, it was a uh, call to ministry, where is the best place to do this? It looked like it could be a good thing. Uh, prayed about it, took advice and all of those things, made the decision. But, uh, and I really felt that, and I talk about it in my book, I in detail, I really felt the burden of leading my family into that and, and really even hurting people who I loved by, by, lead, by leaving. Um, so there was this aspect of the, of the freedom that it brought, um, but, but it was a cost as well. It was, a, it was a great cost. Yes? too much at home it was a it was a failure and I'm just wondering I haven't read your book so I'm not sure what your comment is on that but how you see obviously you've you've, you've kind of indicated that this is a topic that you you know you've obviously covered quite a bit but how you um feel these um gender roles and how you how, how do you define that without getting into stereotypes how how what weight would I give to gender roles yeah, there was a comment that um, Owen Strachan made that if you know you help out too much at home, if there is if this this idea of uh, being a stay-at-home dad is not you know yeah, biblically yeah. aligned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, uh, you know, Owen and I in that in that book, we we would hold to a complementarian view of the scriptures, where the the uh, men are, and women are made equal in the image of God. And yet there's a differences by physical design and functional design uh, in, the, in the marriage and in, and in the church and that the, um, that the husband is called to be head and the wife is called to be helper. And there's, a, there's an, uh, an outward providing and protecting uh, uh, that, that is for the husband primacy and an, and an inward focus in the nurturing uh, of the home as a primacy for the woman. Um, does it mean that a man can't help out around the house? Not at all. Does it mean a woman couldn't work outside of the time? Well, not at all. You, you, you just need to look at Proverbs 31 to see the Proverbs 31 woman is a woman that has a, she's running a business, right? Um, but is what is the primacy of these things? So, so that, it, you know, if a dad is doing so much in and, and his focus is on the ho- inside of the home, he's actually taken the place of, of the wife and mother who that is her particular role and God has designed these things to complement one another for our flourishing. And we might feel certain things, um, but our culture is very egalitarian today to the point where we want to flatten any differences. And so what we're 
in our book, what we're promoting is, is differences that are there from creation, and that's the, the thing, is to look back to creation in Genesis 1 and 2, which is acultural, and in other words, outside of culture, before sin entered the world, and you see these principles in place. And then they're worked out in different ways, in different marriages. Um, be, but, but there should be certain principles in place is what, what the thing is. I think I remember an article Owen wrote uh, about uh, dad, mum, or whatever it is uh, that you might be referring to. Um, so I think that's, if, if that answers some of your question, then, then maybe that's helpful. You can ask me more after if you want. Uh, oh, can I do one last? Cheers. Uh, my question was, what advice would you give to a Christian um, being a witness in particularly kind of quite laddie cultures, you know, kind of as you grew up, you know, you were in a football culture, and uh, I can imagine quite a lot of, especially oil and gas kind of cultures are quite, you know, got that strong masculine um, thing. How, how, how do you think, what tips would you give to be a good, a good witness in those kind of situations, and, and what, were you, was, what was your experience? Hey. Uh, you, are you talking about, because you were talking about my culture and that sort of laddish, are you talking about a, a guy being a witness into that? Because obviously... Uh, well, from my own experience, yeah. It's, yeah, uh, for, yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah, I mean, I would actually say that a laddish culture isn't actually a very masculine culture. It's not really being what a man should be, laddish. But So you can actually be a good witness by actually being a, a good Christian man, a good biblical man. Um, you know, a gentleman. <laughs> uh, we've lost that kind of uh, phrase. But so, as laid out in the scriptures, what a, what a man should be. And actually, then, you become a witness. And so you're slightly different then to the other guys. You aren't, aren't acting in the same way as they're acting, whether it, it's, you know, the, in, in the, the silliness or the way that they might be with women or the way that they might uh, treat, uh, drink. You're a man of God, and you, and, and you would then treat women with... Uh, a respect and an honor and seek to um, protect and provide for, for a woman according to the relationship you might have uh, and not be using them as, as maybe that laddish culture would see it. Um, and you, you would have a certain then weight about you. I, um, there's a lot of lightweight guys out there. You know, they're just jokey-jokey. They're just here for the here and now. And a Christian man has a certain weight to him, a certain seriousness about him. Um, at the same time, being um, uh, patient and kind and loving and generous and all the things of the fruit of the Spirit that we should all, all be. So I think as you pursue a biblical masculinity, or if you're a, a woman, a biblical womanhood, you can actually, and these are these, why these things are very important in our day, because we've not taught well on them. We're not taught about the distinctives. And so then in an egalitarian culture, it just feeds into it. And we don't know what to be or how to act as a man, as a woman, uh, equal in the image of God, but there's a difference, and so then we become a witness. So that's why I think these particular issues we need to be clear on, not just theologically be able to explain them, but to live them out. And then you know what it is, it it's actually becomes evangelistic. Because why are you like this? Because I'm a saved man, and, and, and I live as a, a, according to the way God has designed me to live. And this is what he sets out, and this is good, and this is noble, and this is right. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for your fascinating insight. I'm sure people might have further questions, which they can maybe ask you downstairs. I think just one last question for me, and maybe on behalf of us, is how can and what can we be praying for yourself and Amanda as you um, enjoy the rest of your time here in the UK and as you head back to Canada? Great, yeah. Will we... We go back to London on Tuesday, so you could pray that there's no storms. That would be great. Is there? When? No. Is that true? Well, oh, well. Let's be praying for the weather then. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Um, I think just maybe that the, the Lord would provide these ministry trips. Can they? They're very tiring and and draining. And um, 
that, that he would provide strength. And it is, a, it is amazing that when, when we do travel, um, because people ask those kind of questions and because of the churches we visit, we know that certain people are praying. You, you really feel upheld. Because when you're on the trips, you're out of your normal routine and you don't actually have the time to pray and be in the Word like you would normally. So it's the prayers of the saints that, that, sure. that uplift you. So pray for that. Pray for fruit even from, from this weekend, that, that people will be saved and, and encouraged. Um, and, and then I'd just say finally if you can just pray for keep Calvary Grace Church in your prayers we we face the same kind of things um, that, that you face and uh, you know I'm always remembering that passage in 1 Peter 5 where, where you know the, the Peter says you know don't forget around the world there, there are the brothers and sisters who are suffering the same kind of things yeah. um, and so if you just keep us in prayer in these days that we'd remain faithful to God's word absolutely Let's just close in a a, a prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness to us. Um, We thank you um, for Gavin and for his story and for Amanda together. And we thank you that they've they've come here this evening, they've come to Aberdeen. um, And that, uh, yeah, we just thank you that uh, each of our stories are unique and brilliantly and ordained by you. And we do just ask that uh, as Gavin continues to tell his story, um, and as we tell our stories in our different spheres, um, that, uh, that we, we know that we don't do it in our own strength, we do it in your strength, and that uh, our story without you is nothing. Um, and that we do just ask that these, these, moments of, uh, these moments of you might just fall into the hearts of people whose hearts need to hear it, and that, uh, and that it might fall on the good soil, and that it might be rooted in the word of God, and that they might come to know you one day. We just thank you for Jesus and all that he achieved on that cross for us. We ask you to just go with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so supper will be served downstairs. Thank you.